have a question. Recording is in progress. All right. And, but if you have a question or something I said was confusing or whatever, and you don't want to wait till the end, just find some way to get my attention or take your mute off and interrupt me. Totally fine. Okay. So the, the basic division between white markets and prohibition markets, between medicines and drugs, this was built as a policy solution to a perceived public health crisis surrounding addiction in the late 19th century. So we're talking about 150 years ago in the wake of the Civil War. This period of time was marked by industrialization. And this is my magic power as a historian. If I say the word industrialization, it instantly puts everyone to sleep. And uh, it's very soothing. Um, it's a non-pharmacological way to get your rest. But I have to say a little bit about industrialization and uh, I don't think it will bore you. Industrialization was this transformation of the way that goods were made, goods were circulated and goods were sold. And there were all kinds of new products that were now made by faraway companies and sold by people that you didn't know. And traditionally in America, uh, the rule of the market was caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. And this worked because usually you were buying something from your neighbor or you were buying something from some artisan shop that had been around for however many years. But now there are these new products made by some company off in New York City and sold by somebody who was employed by them and maybe changed from year to year or whatever. And as a result, consumers faced a lot of risks because at the dawn of the industrial era, there weren't a lot of rules of what you were allowed to do. And so a lot of the products were either new and had risks that people didn't know how to protect themselves from, or they were like fraudulent products that had risks because they weren't what they said they were. Drugs were one of these riskier new products. And you can see here, uh, heroin and cocaine are up there on the top. These, these plant drugs had been around for millennia, but the idea of extracting the active principle and distilling it into this incredibly potent powder, that was new. And people did not know what the risks of these more potent forms of the drugs were. And you can see on the bottom of the screen on the left, the hypodermic needle. This was invented in the mid 19th century and came into widespread use after the Civil War. This uh, essentially changed the nature of drugs, made them more powerful and more dangerous in a lot of different ways. And it was totally new. People didn't know what the dangers were. They didn't know how to protect against them. And all this was happening at a time after the Civil War when a whole generation of young people had been wounded physically or wounded psychologically by this terrible war. And so there were a lot of people who were in the market for the kinds of things that these drugs could offer. And as a result, in the late 19th century, uh, many people uh, came into a relationship with drugs that later would be called addiction. This is this compulsive, in some cases, harmful uh, need to continue to use the drug. And you can see here a graph. This is the maximum number of people with addiction per 1,000 population. It's really difficult to calculate these numbers. You know that the numbers today are, are a little bit uh, unreliable, and that's with all the surveillance technology we have. But this is the best historians can do. Move from about 0.7 per 1,000 in 1840 to about 4.6 per 1,000 in 1895. Now, I want to emphasize again that that um, becoming addicted to these drugs was just one kind of harm or risk that consumers were confronting at this unregulated dawn of American corporate capitalism. Now, the great majority of people who were getting access to these new drugs, to morphine and cocaine, uh, were consumers known as patients. And they were buying from physicians or buying from pharmacists with a physician's prescription. And so they mostly came for what I'm going to call the doctor visiting classes. That is, they were white, they were relatively privileged, they had enough money to go see a doctor. They were more likely to be women than men because women visit physicians more often. And they were more likely to be middle-aged than young. Uh, they were about equally divided between cities and rural areas. And they received drugs for an incredibly wide range of forms of human suffering. Uh, everything from hiccups to nymphomania to 
things that, that we don't even really, uh, most people don't even know what they mean anymore. But the one thing they had in common is that most of them, most of them would not be a diagnosis today. Uh, and one observer at the time described them as, quote, the problems of existence. These were drugs that made people feel good. Their risks weren't widely known. And people felt really bad in a wide variety of ways. Their doctors wanted to do something about that. So a lot of people who went to doctors uh, received uh, instructions to use these drugs. Now, a smaller but not insignificant number of consumers came from poorer and racially marginalized communities who did not enjoy access to those medical markets. And because there weren't any laws saying that restricting the sale of the drugs, they were able to buy them too, uh, but it was they were kind of supposed to be bought through the medical system. So it's kind of disreputable to buy them somewhere else. It was not illegal. And these were, at this time, thus they were kind of popular markets or informal markets. And you can see this is a newspaper uh, story from a little bit, it's a little bit later um, from the 1910s, but you can see this kind of a vision of a more disreputable kinds of sales that are that that people would rather not um, have be uh, be seen. Now, it's important to recognize that both of these groups, the consumers buying through the medical system and the consumers buying in popular or informal markets, they were buying drugs for broadly speaking the same reasons. They wanted to ease suffering, and they wanted to pursue pleasure there is really no way to distinguish for a historian to go back and decide, okay, well, these people were trying to ease suffering and these people were trying to ease pleasure, produce pleasure. I'm not even sure whether one could draw a clear and bright line between those two things, uh, even under the best of conditions. So they both were using drugs for similar reasons, and they were both facing the risks of addiction for similar reasons too, which was uh, markets that had gone for, gone, um, gone ahead of existing consumer protections. They just didn't, there weren't the tools around to protect themselves from risks that they may not have even known existed. And again, this wasn't a something that was unique to drugs. Uh, this is a drug addiction and fatal overdose. If you look at the stories about it in the newspaper, they were might be on the same page of the newspaper that was talking about babies starved to death uh, what, because they were fed what was called swill milk, which was this incredibly watery milk that came from cows who had been fed on the leftover slops from making beer. So this was a, a consumer product that was dangerous that consumers didn't know how to protect themselves from because it looked like milk and it smelled like milk and it tasted like milk, but it had no nutritive value. Um, or there were stories of women whose faces were badly uh, badly damaged or disfigured by toxic cosmetics, a new powder that's going to do this or that, but there were no rules about what could be in the powder. So maybe women were blinded applying it to their faces. So drugs and drug harms were just of a piece with this broader, like our ability to manufacture and sell stuff has gotten way ahead of our ability to set rules that would protect consumers as they bought them. Now, the reformers who stepped up in the late 19th, early 20th century to address these market crises, like things have gotten ahead, we need to catch up. We need our rules to catch up with the way that the economy looks now. These folks were a particular kind of person. They were native born, white. Uh, they would have described themselves as Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Um, and when they looked out at the world of drug, the drug crisis, they did not see these commonalities that I'm describing to you because they believed that those doctor visiting classes were very different kinds of people than those urban racialized minorities. And so they saw two different problems. They saw that patients who bought from physicians and pharmacists were innocent victims of markets run amok and that they needed protection. And I don't know if you can read that slide on the left. This is a uh, uh, this is a newspaper article, uh, a reformist article talking about the opium habits power in the late 19th century. And it's an article about people who had become addicted through a physician's prescription. And it says, to no class of unfortunates should our floodgates of pity, sympathy, and commiseration be wider opened than to the victims of opium. It is not a vice which afflicts them, but a disease 
which presents as marked and as specific a symptomatology as do many of the better known diseases and requiring as they do proper medical aid and a systematic treatment to effect a cure. This is like 1880. So they're already talking in this language of addiction as a disease. However, the other consumers they saw as purposefully deviant criminals who were using drugs because they wanted to be deviant. Uh, and they said, society needs protection from these folks. Instead of trying to protect them, we need to be protected from them. And you can see here on the right, there's a, a, a newspaper headline, uh, Negro cocaine fiends are a new Southern menace. The article goes on to argue that, um, that white policemen in the South needed bigger gauge guns to be able to kill these supposed cocaine crazed Negroes uh, who were bent on raping white women because the cocaine made them superhuman. So they needed more weaponry to take them down. And then in the bottom, you can see an image from, there was a whole ton of middle-class magazines that where journalists would go into these uh, institutions called opium dens, where Chinese Americans where these were sort of like their version of saloons or bars in European American communities at that time, but they were portrayed as these nefarious dark places where you can see there a smirking Chinese man is luring these society ladies in to smoking opium where they would be enslaved and trapped into what at the time they, they called white slavery. So rather than recognizing similarities between the different kinds of drug use, drug cultures, drug markets, they saw these as very different. And this shaped their efforts to do something about the problem. Uh, they introduced an approach that was fundamentally divided into two. Uh, they wanted to divide policy between a medical policy and a non-medical policy. And those non-medical markets, the ones on the right there, they got the policy that the US is most famous for, which is punitive drug prohibition, the drug war. Uh, it's designed to protect society from these racialized urban dope fiends. That's what they were called at the time, dope fiends, those consumers. Medical markets got something very different. They got regulation, beginning with the Food and Drug Act of 1906, which required honest labeling. Label had to be truthful, but it didn't prohibit the sale of anything. A, uh, you could sell whatever you wanted as long as you were truthful on the label of what it was. The goal was consumer safety, not consumer restriction. Let consumers know what they're buying so they can protect themselves. And it created this new institution, the Food and Drug Administration, to enforce that rule. Both the prohibition aspect and the regulation aspect were written into a new law in 1914 called the Harrison Anti-Narcotic Act, which imposed on the one hand, America's most robust consumer protections to date on medical markets, much more robust than those protecting people from cosmetics or, or, uh, or uh, tainted meat and so on and so forth. And then on the other hand, it formally created prohibition markets by criminalizing all non-medical sales and all non-medical possession. And I emphasize that non-medical possession part because another story that we can talk about in the Q&A if you want, but that alcohol prohibition was being passed at around the same time, but uh, with alcohol, possession wasn't illegal, only the, only the sale was illegal. Okay, so with this, uh, there were the government had been given two different sets of tools. One set of tools to regulate white markets, to regulate medical markets. The other set of tools to police and punish uh, popular informal markets. And in white markets, authorities use this new regulatory power to protect consumers from dangerous kinds of sales. So you can see here, these are evidence that pharmaceutical companies, uh, they weren't happy about giving up a set of profitable drugs. And so they kept trying to um, produce some new opioid and say, well, this one isn't this one isn't addictive. This one doesn't cause addiction, especially if you use it for um, you know for medical purposes. On the left there, Pentapon, uh, Roche Pharmaceuticals, in as early as the 1920s, was trying to say, well, this is you know heroin and morphine are addictive because that's just you just take out one part of the opium flower and use it. This pentapon has all the different alkaloids that occur naturally in the opioid poppy. 
it's more natural, it's organic, you might say. And so it doesn't cause addiction. Uh, but the FBN, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, was able to say, you're not allowed to claim that. Our researchers show that it is addictive. And the same thing happened with Demerol in, um, in the, uh, in the post-war era, it's a, it is a, um, it's a fully synthetic opioid. And you can see here, this is a pharma sales rep weekly magazine. And you can see this cowboy is like money, money is everywhere. And one of the drugs that's the big rainmaker is Demerol. So the pharmaceutical industry was trying long before OxyContin, was trying to sell the next OxyContin, but the feds had the power to say no. Importantly, and this is really crucial, white market opioids were also sold to treat people who were addicted to opioids. Now, technically, according to the Harrison Act, this was illegal, but prohibition was designed for those urban racialized minorities. And so, if you were outside of cities, say you were a country doctor in rural Tennessee, nobody was going to be checking in and bothering you if you just, you know, quietly prescribed morphine to a couple of patients who had become addicted. And you can see here, uh, Lawrence Cole, the America's leading addiction expert and uh, the future uh, Surgeon General of the U.S., he, when he ran across this kind of situation, sometimes he would evaluate it. And, you and look at his language here. Uh, in approving, he's saying this doctor should continue prescribing morphine. He said, I have little doubt that this patient will be a better citizen as a legitimate addict than he will be if his legal supply is cut off. And if you think about that logic, uh, it's very different from that prohibitionist logic being applied to the cities. He's basically saying this person can continue to work and continue to support a family, whereas if we cut him off, he'll have to go and buy from those hated peddlers and his family will be uh, will suffer the consequence. My, my research into this kind of practice shows that even during the height of this first drug war era in the first half of the 20th century, there were more people with addiction who were being quietly prescribed morphine by physicians than there were in the cities being called junkies and being hounded by police. In other words, this was a more common experience of addiction this kind of uh, informal maintenance with uh, morphine maintenance. So uh, this there was this huge archipelago of uh, white market patients who were, uh, on the one hand, they were protected from addiction in the first place by these robust consumer protections. But if they did get addicted, there was a system in place, informal, full of holes, not ideal, but it existed to take care of them. But in prohibition markets, uh, none of this was available. Nobody was protecting consumers by teaching them how to use these drugs safely. Instead, it was all just illegal. And uh, the kind of products that they bought, in fact, weren't selected by, for by the market um, to be the ones that were in their best interests. Instead, it was whichever ones were easiest to smuggle because it was illegal. So the big uh, informal market drug used to be smoking opium. Smoking opium is bulky and it's smelly. So it's a terrible drug for smuggling. So when that prohibition law came down, popular markets switched drugs. They switched to heroin. Heroin is odorless, it's potent, so it's small, easy to smuggle. And what that meant is you switched from a relatively safe form of use, smoking opium, sure it had its risks, but not a lot, compared to in heroin for injection. And so those markets were actually magnifying the harm of the consumers who bought in them. And if they did get addicted, if they did suffer harm, instead of getting care, they got punished. They were sent to jail. So even as white markets for opioids got safer, prohibition markets continued to be a complete and utter catastrophe for consumers. Their opioid crisis never ended. As a matter of fact, their opioid crisis has continued pretty much unbroken from the late 19th century to the present day, 150 years. Now, this two-tiered setup of policy looks familiar to historians because it looks like a lot of other reforms from this so-called progressive era. The progressives, these were the folks who invented the regulatory state, 
to rationalize and make safer these consumer markets in the new industrial economy, but they were also obsessed with economic and racial hierarchies. They are the ones who invented racial segregation as a reform to make society more rational and function better. They were, some of them were the ones who pursued eugenic sterilization campaigns to make sure that the unfit didn't have children and to encourage the fit, uh, you know, in other words, people like them to have more children. And they were the ones who helped to pass draconian immigration restriction in the 1920s that basically cut off immigration from anywhere other than Western Europe for the next 40, 50 years. So these were the guys who invented the regulatory state and modernized the racist state. And in drug policy, they did both by segregating American drug markets, just like they were segregating housing, they were segregating popular leisure, they were segregating education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This was their tool or one of their tools for accomplishing what they thought were these goals uh, of rationalizing society. Now, uh, in a terrible irony, their approach to them seemed to work because this prohibition market policing made consumers there spectacularly visible. They kept getting arrested. They kept desperately showing up at charity hospitals when they weren't able to buy uh, the heroin that they needed. So they were really visible. And their continuing presence uh, was just a, an obvious thing. And as a result, they became, they became the subject of the first generation of researchers who were studying addiction. And so that they had a very distinctive experience of addiction. They experienced addiction under circumstances in which it was illegal, in which avenues for participating in society were being shut off. And so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the people with addiction in cities uh, in these racialized prohibition markets at this time, the only work they could get was in other illegal trades, sex work, gambling, uh, robbery, things like this. And so these, this generation of experts who studied addiction at this time were like, oh, well, addiction leads to crime. Like people who use drugs, they lie, they commit crimes, and they're downwardly social, downward social mobility. And they thought those were elements of addiction itself. They didn't recognize that it was their own policies that were creating those kind of experiences for people using drugs at that time. Then on the other hand, this clandestine system of morphine maintenance allowed white market consumers to be pretty invisible. They didn't show up in hospitals desperate. They didn't get arrested. And so a lot of authorities figured that they had just simply stopped using drugs. Once authorities had said, hey, these are bad for you, you could get addicted. They were just like, look, all these good white market consumers just stopped. And what that meant is when they looked out at America after they put in their policies, they saw um, not, well, we, we applied two different policies to the same problem and one set of policies worked and one didn't. That's the story I'm telling. The problem was basically the same problem, and, but they applied two different policies. The white market policies worked pretty well and the prohibition market policies were a disaster. They didn't see that. Instead, they said, well, we, try, we told everyone to stop using drugs and these good people did that and these bad people didn't do that. And so we were right to say that these were really different people, right? It's not good policy that worked in white markets. It's just that white markets are full of good people who didn't want to be addicted. They wanted to stop. Whereas those prohibition markets, they're just full of people we knew they were bad and now we have proof. They just continued to use drugs even after they knew that it was bad for them. Okay, so that's the origins, um, that's the origins of this divide and that's the how it came into pass and how it was of a piece with other things that were other policies that were developed at that time. Now, let me just skate through uh, a little bit more quickly the uh, how this how these policies uh, were persistent over the 20th century, the kinds of uh, failures that they had to prevent more problems from arising. And then and I'll also look at this little one moment when there was a reconsideration of this kind of approach. Now, as I said, 
this system worked better for white market consumers than it did for prohibition market consumers, but ultimately everyone's going to pay a price. And the first time, uh, we already know the price for the prohibition market consumers. They are uh, buying substances that they can't be sure are safe or are what they're supposed to be. They are forced out of the regular economy. They are punished if they are caught uh, or harmed. But white market customers end up paying a price too, because soon enough, there are new drugs discovered to take the place of opioids and cocaine in treating the pains of existence for white market consumers. Um, and both physicians and consumers were really eager for these drugs, and pharmaceutical companies were really eager to help them get access to them. And you can see here on the left, this is one of the earliest advertisements for Viranol, a barbiturate, uh, similar to benzodiazepines like Valium and Xanax. Uh, and it, above the clouds, they promised. Uh, and this is from like 1910, maybe 1915. And then on the right here is an advertisement for benzodrine sulfate. This is an amphetamine. And uh, you can see that guy is looking very, uh, you know, re-energized uh, re by, by the pills. And these were introduced in the 1930s, came into widespread use during World War II and, and right afterwards. So they launched huge marketing blitzes for these drugs. Let's see. And like he does, he does look like Superman. Um, they launched huge marketing blitzes for them and for the later generations of these drugs, particularly the benzodiazepines, which were discovered in the uh, released in the 1960s, and new and other forms of uh, stimulants. So this is an advertisement from the 19, I think it's the late 1960s uh, for Ritalin, which is an amphetamine-like stimulant. And you can see it advertises, hey, you know, traffic jams are so depressing. That would bring anybody down. Maybe a little speed will will help you. Um, and they so they really broadened the range of kinds of suffering that uh, they were said they said it's appropriate to prescribe these drugs for this very wide range of suffering. Uh, and the companies lobbied, uh, you know, like bears to try to prevent any limitations, any any legal limits on how they could sell these drugs. This worked. This worked really well because addiction had become so thoroughly associated with poor and racialized urban communities, become so associated with criminals. So it was easy to say, well, look, you know, these nice white suburban housewives aren't going to get addicted. They're too nice for that. So we don't have to worry. And plus, we're a respectable pharmaceutical company. We're not some seedy street drug pusher. Everyone here is health seeking. And addiction can only happen when people are deviant or criminals. And you can see how that kind of logic would make it harder to impose limits on, on the sale of these drugs especially when there's tons and tons of money behind the, you know, exchanging hands with uh, between the lobbyists and the, and the Congress people. So a second and even more massive white market drug boom was fueled at this time uh, by sales to consumers who did not get the tools they needed to protect themselves from the, from the risks of the products they were buying, because everyone just figured, well, you're, you're safe. And you can see uh, it, um, it just, expands hugely in mid-century. And this is a much larger problem uh, than the late 19th century problem in terms of um, per 1,000 in terms of total volume. And this time, it involved a lot of fatal overdose because barbiturates are, are sedatives. And it's possible to overdose on them, especially if you mix with alcohol or if you've forgotten how many you've taken because they can cause confusion and things of this sort. So fatal overdoses rose by factors of five or more uh, over this time. And I put this in here to, to give some comparison. The, obviously, the opioid epidemic has involved many more, a much higher rate of fatal overdose, but this wasn't, this wasn't a minor public health problem at the time. Uh, and it's nobody would consider it minor, even if it were to happen today. Now, so, so there were big problems, lots of people developing addiction or having overdose for these drugs. But reformers were unable to convince authorities to do anything about it. 
And you can see here, this is that slaves of the devil capsules that I showed earlier. This was this was evidence of, a, of an attempt to say, hey, this is a big public health crisis. We should do something to rein in these drugs. Uh, but it didn't work this time. It didn't work this time because uh, the only reason that they'd been able to succeed the first time around is that they had brought together two different political constituencies, reformers who wanted to rationalize capitalism and uh, racists who wanted to control, uh, protect white supremacy and to make sure that the social hierarchies remained intact. And together they were able to overcome the hardest fighting of the pharmaceutical companies. But with these, um, the uh, those moral crusaders, the uh, the the people whose main issue was racial hierarchy, they weren't very interested in the pills. Everyone involved in the pills was white. The companies making them were white. The doctors prescribing them were white. The pharmacists selling them were white. The consumers buying them were white. There wasn't any uh, there wasn't any invitation to do racial policing through those pills, and so they just didn't join in the campaign. And that left the reformers alone to fight against the pharmaceutical industry, and they just failed. The pharmaceutical industry is incredibly powerful. And so this went on for decades. Uh, uh, reformers first started to notice problems with barbiturates in the 1930s, still going incredibly strong in the 1950s. And by the way, Congress did pass incredibly draconian uh, intensification of prohibition drug laws in the 1950s including mandatory minimum jail sentences and even the death penalty for a first offense of selling to a minor. It was never actually applied, but still, uh, they were able to get those passed, but nothing to restrict the sale of um, uppers and downers. This situation changed briefly in the 60s and 70s. And this was when, uh, this was a time, not accidentally, when a whole bunch of kinds of segregation came under challenge in America. Uh, segregation by sex, segregation by race, and uh, one of the one of the things that got challenged was drug market segregation as well. So you had civil rights activism by African Americans in particular and by women who challenged the cultural logic that that justified treating medical and non-medical drug markets and drug users so differently. They forefronted the humanity of racialized people like these are these are human people deserving of dignity who have the same um the same essential uh humanity and rights as white people and also feminists insisted that authorities should take women's problems seriously so one of the reasons why these white markets were so um skewed towards women is that doctors would hear women complain about stuff and be like ah eh, it's just all in your head, have a pill. And feminists said, actually, some of these problems are not all in our heads. They are political problems that need to be taken seriously. And both of these made it possible to recognize similarities between the experiences of people using drugs across the medical and non-medical divide. And this combined with a, new, uh, with a new political coalition, a political coalition of called, sometimes called the third wave consumer movement, that was all about saying corporations have gotten really huge. They're now doing things like calculating that, oh, well, we could fix the Ford Pinto because it keeps exploding when people crash into it from a certain angle, but it would cost X amount to fix it. And we think we'll only pay out half of X to when people die and we're sued. We'll, it'll be cheaper to just let people die from the car crashes. And, some, and it brought about this new political coalition Champion in a lot of ways by President John F. Kennedy to um, to introduce new uh, regulations to restrain corporate profit seeking, and the result was a set of laws that these days, much later, are associated with the drug war. This is the Controlled Substances Act and the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, and it's true that they eventually did become drug war laws, but for just a little moment, they function quite differently. Uh, in white markets, they did not prohibit drug sales. Uh, they responded to the upper and downer crisis by making those markets safer through consumer protections that limited pharmaceutical companies' ability to encourage new consumers uh, by ignoring risks. They, these drugs remained widely available, including to people who were addicted to them legally. 
uh, and these consumer protection policies worked. Upper sales of uppers and downers declined, but so did ER visits and overdose deaths at the same time. And we know that that can be challenging because and it suggests that the decline was in new users and that people who developed an addiction or a dependence, um, that they were able to continue to buy legally. Meanwhile, uh, for the first time in United States history, white market protections were extended beyond the privileged group of consumers who were called patients uh, through the mechanism of methadone. It's a legal quality controlled, FDA approved, long acting opioid that was approved for treating people with addiction. Now, the regulations for providing methadone went way overboard. It resembled more like a prison operation than a true white market. Um, we can talk about that, but it was a radical departure from a very long history of absolute segregation between white markets and pro prohibition markets. Now, this moment uh, was short-lived in part because these laws, uh, despite exceptions like methadone, they still really leaned into and doubled down on this segregated foundation of American drug policy in saying that all non-medical drug use was still illegal. And that meant that when the political tides changed and backlash against feminism, civil rights became public policy, uh, it was easy to snap these laws back to the traditional purpose uh, of, um, of market segregation. First, the white backlash against civil rights helped power a renewed war against drugs that was really harmful to communities of color who were already grappling with the unregulated prohibition markets for drugs like uh, that emerged like crack cocaine uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Meanwhile, conservatives like these fellows here attacked the regulatory state and attacked social welfare programs, instead promising that if we unleashed the private sector, the private sector will do a better job of solving intractable problems. One of those intractable problems was chronic pain. With addiction, once again associated with urban racialized communities, the crack scare was intensely racialized and uh, was portrayed as taking place among black and brown people in cities. Uh, it became believable again that white people were kind of not very likely to become addicted. And so it became possible to do things. We all know that Purdue Pharma you know, swore left and right and up and down that its drug wouldn't be addictive to anybody. But the question is, why did anyone believe that? We've known opioids are addictive for thousands of years. Why would anyone believe somebody making that claim about a powerful opioid? And the answer is that they were very selective in who they made those claims about. Uh, OxyContin was marketed in white areas using white models exclusively. And they were leaning on this, uh, this long-standing set of assumptions about the people who sell drugs in white markets, like, hey, I'm a pharmaceutical company, I'm not a drug dealer. Uh, the people who prescribe them, doctors care about their patients, they wouldn't do anything harmful to them. And the people who use them, they are health seeking, they want health, and that for that reason, they won't get addicted. So you saw a huge boom in the sales of all three classes of potentially addictive substances in white markets, all at the same time in the in the 1990s. And this is, isn't because we know the story of pain and how that helped expand prescribing of opioids, but amphetamine and benzodiazepines were booming at the exact same time. Uh, and people don't tend to ask why that happened. And the answer is that all three were responding to these broader social developments. And thanks, uh, thanks to these two trends, that's where you, that's where how we end up where we started in that uh, in the early 21st century with the most acute case yet of what have been the pro chronic problems of American drug policy. Uh, Underregulated white markets, which produce uh, widespread addiction and overdose among the doctor visiting classes, and uh, punitively published pu punished prohibition markets that contribute to this intensely racialized mass incarceration. So let me just conclude by saying history offers a clear suggestion of how to respond to this kind of crisis and how to step out of this long history. And while it is in practice very complicated, conceptually, it's quite simple, which is 
that we should desegregate drugs the way that we try to, or that we have tried to desegregate other elements of American life over the last half of a century. Um, segregated drug policy and segregated drug markets simply don't work to accomplish the goal of ensuring that people get the benefits of this kind of consumer good, these psychoactive substances, and, and are protected from the harms. White markets have been too loosely regulated, leading to wave after wave of crisis for over a century. And meanwhile, thanks to punitive prohibition, uh, informal markets have been even worse, just a constant public health disaster. Why should some consumers get regulated access to drugs and care if they are harmed, while others face prohibition markets and punishment, uh, especially when they're harmed? This this logic was built at a particular historical moment by particular historical actors who, for all of their good ideas about organizing the economy or what you know, regulating capitalism, they they were they were racists who believed that the races shouldn't mix. They believed that the white race was better, and they implemented a ton of policies uh, that they honestly believed would make a better world because they believed they believed uh, they believed in racial hierarchy. And we have challenged the systems they set up, many of them, challenged residential segregation, challenged educational segregation. Sure, whether, I mean, those, those structures still exist, but they are, uh, they're something that we recognize as something to fight against and push against. This, uh, this set of drug policies, that one is not usually included as among these segregated policies that we ought to be doing something about. In my, uh, in my thinking, we've, we've rethought a lot of the other policies that this kind of founding generation of white reformers came up with, and it's long past time to challenge this one as well. And I'll stop there and hope that I haven't talked you into sleep and that we can have a conversation about it. Have a question. Can yeah. I ask a question? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for very, very thorough historical perspective. I, I did not fall asleep, and I appreciate the um, your your setting up that industry industrialization in America and how it set the stage for what happened with regards to this topic. Uh, where do you see where we're going now? We're living in the information age, and there are changes that it's going and we hope for the best. Um, and can you comment a little bit about the legalization of marijuana? Is, is that an attempt to kind of merge the two things that you're talking about? Thank you. Yeah, those are great questions. And um, I, I heard two different questions in there. One just being, uh, I had posed at the beginning, are we going to continue along these, the policy traditions that have dominated much of the 20th century, or are we going to try to build something different and new? And, you know, uh, as a historian, a lot of the things that you see look very familiar, like you've seen them before. And, and that's true of a lot of what's going on now. But there is one thing going on now that I can say with certainty hasn't happened before with one possible with one possible precedent, which is a pretty interesting one. But that is that uh, throughout this whole history, people who used drugs did not have a voice in any of these things that I've been talking about. They did not have a collectively organized political voice in decisions that were often about them. And through harm reduction and through the a variety of kinds of uh, organizing and collective action associated with that, that's really new, uh, particularly the, the combination of harm reduction with anti-racist organizing to really recognize the, the social contributions to uh, drugs as a, as a problem, when, when drugs are a problem. Um, so that's kind of, as a historian, that's really exciting to me because that, that seems like, I mean, I hope that people working in harm reduction recognize how unprecedented they are, like that 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 they are 
um, there used to be this thing you call them world historical actors, like people involved in the major changes that you read about in the history textbooks and all. It's an incredibly important thing. And to the extent that, that they can succeed in uh, bending the arc of these policies towards justice, it's a, it's a legitimately a new, a new factor on the landscape. So that's what gives me hope. Um, <laughs> arrayed against that hope is, man, 150 years is a long time where one side of this has been winning dominantly. And if you were going to bet your money just looking on the history, you'd say that once white people are no longer in the are no longer the public face of addiction then the then prohibition and punishment is going to come back uh, if there's a an addiction crisis that's in like immigrant communities a community that's already under political attack then that's going to be such an inviting prospect to people who want to uh, police and stigmatize and exclude those communities that they're going to that they're going to seize on it now, this time, they've got organized opponents who have had the time and intelligence and experiences because of the experiences of people who use drugs introducing, being being um, injecting themselves into this conversation that it's going to be a bigger battle. so i'm 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 hopeful. But you know, you got to be you got to be careful too. There's no inevitable good guys are going to win this. There's just absolutely no guarantees at all. Then in terms of um, cannabis decrim, I mean, that's really fascinating because it's a little bit on a knife edge, right? That means different things. Every state, it means something different. In some states, there is a an explicit attempt to undo past injustices of cannabis criminalization by favoring, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of money to be made, try to make it so that the people who make that money are people from communities that were harmed by the policies in the past. In other words, in other states, it's just like, uh, all right, tax dollars, let's go. Let's just create an industry. And and, and it's a real, it's real evidence of the challenge that we face uh, because threading a middle path where you try to recognize that um, the profit motive is a dangerous thing. Like sure, drugs have risks, but it's the profit motive that has turned those risks into social crises. So we're going to have to regulate it. But when you're going to build regulations, who's in the room? The people in the room tend to be the money people, and so they make sure that the regulations are uh, tend to be obstacles for consumers rather than obstacles for their profit seeking. And so, I mean, it's it's a real challenge. And and what I see with cannabis is that if that if we get that wrong in some way, for example, if we if cannabis becomes the new tobacco or something, that'll be a huge blow to uh, in this battle that I'm talking about between drug warriors and uh, the kinds of social justice reforms associated with harm reduction. And so it's really important to get cannabis right, even though cannabis isn't that dangerous a drug. And I will tell you that if there is a way to make it dangerous, <laughs> huge corporations will be the ones who can find it. <laughs> Not to mention the long-term pulmonary outcome, potentially from sure. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. I I appreciate you you introduced the roles of Asian Americans into the drug history in America. But can you explain? Span a little bit more about because opioid came from you know Asia. Um, was there anything that we missed in your historical perspective? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, so um, I will say that the latest, what is it? It's it's uh, what are they? Bo anthro it's a bo bo botanical archaeology archaeo. Sorry, archaeologists who study plants that they. Um, that it seems that uh, opium poppy first uh, emerged in Europe, actually, uh, in way, way in the past, um, in the in before uh, human records, and uh, and was used there before uh, migrating through Central Asia. And so, you know, one of the one of the biggest stories 
in this is that uh, drugs first became a first became social problems during the era of imperialism when drugs were essentially they were often the most important products that empires were building empires to take advantage of. So you know why do you why do you build an empire? It's so that you can extract resources from a place and get money from it. There's no it's not like fun ruling people who don't want to be ruled. You do it for the money. And so what are the resources you can extract? Well, there's a lot of different ones we know about, you know, like gold or 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 cotton. But some of the most some of the most um profitable ones were were drugs, tobacco, and in particular opium. And and for opium, this was uh, the British Empire established was was facing this problem in its trade relations with China. In the 19th century, China was wealthier and had better um, production capacities than um, than nations in Europe. And so Europe bought a lot of stuff from China, and China basically didn't buy anything made in Europe. And this was a problem for, for Britain in particular because they were mercantilists. They believed that trade was a zero-sum game and the more you sold, the more you won, and the more you bought, the more you lost. And so when they when Britain took India, they noticed that one of the local trade things going on was that smoking opium was sold from India into China. And so, oh, there's something that China buys. And so Britain leaned into this opium trade doing all of those horrifying imperial things to, you know, uh, basically uh, enforce a kind of slavery in the, in the opium production in India, just forcing farmers to produce tons and tons of opium, sending it to China. And the first, um, the Chinese government at this time, um, the first, uh, they, they announced the first sort of anti-drug war. They said, hey, this foreign product coming in is causing problems. We're going to outlaw it. And Britain uh, just was like, well, we really don't want you to do that. And it just so happens that that recently we have been building this world empire and building this huge military. And we'll come and we're going to insist that, that uh, you keep this product legal. And up until this time, it hadn't been clear just how unequal the military power had grown between these European empires and China. And over the course of two opium wars, they were called the opium wars in the mid 19th century, uh, Britain forced China to legalize the importation and sale of smoking opium. Scholars debate how whether this was actually a big health problem within China. Um, some scholars say, you know, well, there was a whole lot of opium smoking, so that's bad. And others say, well, if you actually look at the records, you know, it wasn't it wasn't that harmful. Most people weren't doing it to an extent that uh, that harmed them. It's more like bars and alcohol drinking and uh, that were common in Europe and America. But it did mean that it was a really common practice. So that when um, when economic changes uh, uh, encouraged a whole bunch of Chinese workers to travel across the globe looking for work, including a bunch of them coming to America, they brought this practice with them, especially because it was largely a young male population. Um, and in the places where they arrived, there was incredible racism against them. They weren't welcomed and incorporated into society. They were they were excluded and segregated into so-called Chinatowns um, and then um, and then judged for the for the condition of these impoverished, overcrowded, China towns uh, as if they had chosen for them to be that way. And so opium smoking became a symbol of this problematic people who, um, who uh, were competing for American jobs and were behaving strangely and, and were maybe seen as a little possibly queer because there weren't a lot of women with them. And so, uh, in this, we just this story abounds with these terrible ironies. Like this was, opium smoking had become so common in China because British Empire had insisted on it, and then smoking opium uh, in Britain and in America and Europe had become uh, understood as like this just racial characteristic of Chinese people, 
uh, and it was a threat to Americans because they were bringing this scary foreign drug to American shores. So yeah, so there's that, there's, that was as briefly as I can tell that story, but it's a huge and important one. <laughs> Excuse me. Ooh, and I remembered, I'm sorry, I remembered the, from earlier the precedent of a time when drug users' voices were inserted into the story. The drug users were drinkers, alcohol drinkers, and the story is the end of prohibition. Um, uh, let's see, the quickest way to say this. Alcohol prohibition was primarily a, an effort by uh, people who considered themselves the, the real white people, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the Western Europeans, to, um, to try to protect traditional America from the threats that they saw coming from Southern and Eastern European immigrants, so like Italians, and Poles and Russians who were Catholic and Jewish largely instead of Protestant. And they spoke these different languages and they were considered to be racially inferior by the real white people. And also by uh, uh, formerly enslaved African-Americans who had been under control in slavery, but were now, uh, you know, um, were now threatening to play an actual role in, uh, a political role and have a political voice in American society through reconstruction and stuff like this. So the goal was to, uh, that these, the prohibition reformers said, well, what's happening is these big companies, these alcohol companies are like, um, are catering to these threatening populations. And because saloons are like this, the center of American politics, that's where the voting booths were and that's where you would go to uh to do your voting and stuff that they're creating this political threat and so if we outlaw alcohol that'll like cut the legs off of this scary political machine and prohibition was passed like you know it was passed by people who did not believe the federal government should be doing a lot of stuff the republican party was the ones that passed prohibition and so they didn't actually fund prohibition very much and the people that, and instead they kind of deputized people to enforce it, uh, you know, deputized locals to enforce it. And the biggest organization that they deputized was the Ku, Ku Klux Klan, which had this big resurgence in the 1920s. And the Ku Klux Klan would do things like go into the Italian neighborhood and barge into people's tenement apartments and uh, supposedly looking for booze, but then they would take down the crucifixes and stomp them on the floor. And, and, uh, and they would do terrible things in black neighborhoods. And one of the things that happened is that um, this politicized groups of people who had been Republican voters, Black people, the immigrants in big cities, and they were really unhappy about this. And starting in the late 1920s, they migrated to the Democratic Party, which was saying things like, we're going to repeal prohibition and get these get these thugs out of your house, <laughs> right? And so they spoke with their votes and uh, and they were, it's a relatively unacknowledged but hugely important element of Roosevelt's triumph over Herbert Hoover was um, working class immigrants and black people who were pissed off about prohibition voting for someone who said they were gonna repeal prohibition. And so that's a, that is a little bit of a precedent. Um, it's kind of a, not an obvious one. Do any of our public health um, people have uh, questions? I, I'm guessing you do. It's a lot of stuff to process. I mean, that it's a ton of information just flowing across a transom. I'm reminded of, I just watched um, a John Oliver report from maybe not this weekend, but the weekend before um, where he talked about psychedelics. Mm. And it was very good. He really did a very comprehensive job of it. And, but he was talking about a point in time in the sixties and seventies when psychedelics were viewed as possible you know treatments for things like alcoholism and that that all went to hell 
um, in the in the seventies with the drug war, and that he sees this opportunity now, especially with PTSD, for this to be a good treatment if it's handled properly. But he's he was very nervous that it it would get messed up again, and it's an unfortunate thing because he's he see it, and I thought he was convincing that it was could be really really beneficial for people. Yeah, a and so one of the I mean, I've been watching this psychedelic renaissance with with a lot of interest and a little concern for this reason. Um, we our healthcare system strongly favors treatments that can be mass produced cheaply, and so that's one of the reasons why it favors pills, right? Um, and one of the things that seems really clear about psychedelic therapy is that it's not going to be mass producible, that it's incredibly unique for each individual and that it's going to take, it's not, it's that to do it right means really uh, uh, taking time with each individual, having experts over the course of days, like there isn't going to be a like take two of these and call me in the morning kind of situation. And so unless we have a, a deeper rethinking about how our medical system works, I don't see how psychedelics get integrated into it. I, you know, I, not that I give out investment advice, but I am not investing in psychedelics because unless, because we don't, haven't shown that we, we will really invest our social resources into something unless it can return massive profits. And I, I just, I mean, massive profits come from mass sales. I don't understand how that'll work given what we know about how psychedelics function, which is it's not the drug itself. The reason why that promising research in the 60s and 70s died out is because double-blind placebo-controlled trials became required. And that and those controls um, required you to isolate the drug effects from everything else. Well, the drug effects with psychedelics aren't what does the trick. It's the interactions and experiences you have while you are under the drug's effects. I don't know a way you monetize that. It's going to be labor intensive. It's going to be unique. So, I, you know, I, the most likely outcome is that rich people will be able to access this and nobody else will. Um, I guess that's the better bad outcome. The worst bad outcome is that rich people access it in a way that is safe and everyone else accesses versions of it that are not safe and and that would be pretty bad yeah i agree with you it would, it would take a whole reconcept reconceptualization of what we think of as health that looks at things over a long term like how does this benefit the society you know over the course of an individual's lifetime mm. rather than how do we solve this right here and now i i completely agree with you yeah unfortunately Thank you anyone, so much. Sure. Does anyone else have any questions? Anything they want to say? I don't want to manipulate the conversation here. Lots of thanks. Before we say goodbye to Professor Herzberg, I would like to remind you that um, this, well, this is nearly the last of our OPEP uh, speeches, our, our presentations. Mm -hmm. But on um, uh, in April, we're actually going to have a an in person event. After mm. years. We're so excited. Um, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with Joshua Lynch, who helped found Matters. So he's going to speak about fentanyl. And although it's not new, um, he's going to be talking about how that's really changed um, the opioid crisis in, in many ways, but, but especially because it's now it's available in so many other things besides just um, mm. opioids. And um, and he'll of course talk about harm reduction and things like that. But I'm looking forward to that as well. So you know, I encourage everyone to come to this. You can register on our website, and I will I'll send this link to everyone who came to this meeting as well. Thank um, you. Yeah, of course. That'll that'll be really interesting. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Thank. So can you. I can I say thank you oh, to you all for uh, for being here and for. Um, uh, if you if a question comes up or anything you want to chat about, just feel free to drop me an email. 
I'm, you know, I'm a, a professor at a public university. I got office hours. I will talk to anybody. Uh, <laughs> I, I aspire to be a resource. So uh, let me know. And I hope this was helpful to you. I hope that that you feel this was time well spent. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And I enjoyed this. I think I told you I'm a historian by training. So it's very exciting to me. Um, but I'm sure everyone else benefited a great deal. And so thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming. I appreciate it. And um, thank you for allowing me to record this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Beneficial. Thank, thank you so much. Let me stop the recording. Yes.